thing. Pardon? You step onto it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Great. And it's, yeah, very weird. Mm -hmm. A new, it's a new one for me. Yeah. yeah. You should definitely make lots of work about the frozen bog. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely should do. I think tomorrow, I think we've got tomorrow. So I'm going to have to go out and do some, um, like, videoing stuff. Um, because we've, I think it's going to warm up at the rest of the week. Okay. Supposedly. Oh, apparently we could be heard. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, well, then apparently we can't be seen. My friend, my friend Nicole, who can now. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, okay, cool. We well, we can to start now. Okay, we can start. Maybe right. if we turn off the presentation, we'll be able to see our faces if that's possible, Lucy. Yeah, just to start. But yes, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Ruth Dorber, and I'm the assistant curator here at Wising Art Center, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, for anyone that's unfamiliar with Wising Desktop Studio Visits, they are a strand of our online events program aimed at highlighting research from recent artists in residence and sharing new works in progress. You can listen to old episodes on podcast platforms or access them via our Wising broadcast page, a link to which we will put in the chat for you. I am delighted to be joined today by the amazing Belladonna Paloma, who completed her residency with us earlier this year. And Belladonna is joining us from her studio in Shetland. So hi, Belladonna. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you very much. Should um, I do the same? Oh, but I'm just going to say a few audio descriptions of ourselves. Great. Perfect. So I am a white woman in my early 30s and I'm wearing a black jumper. I have small silver earrings on and I have wavy blonde hair and I'm sat in a studio at Wising and there's a white wall behind me and a clock. So Belladonna, if you would like to describe yourself for us. Thanks. Sorry. Jumping the gun there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Belladonna Paloma. Uh, my pronouns are also she, her. Um, I, yes, uh, uh, as a description of me, I'm um, a white trans woman with bleached blonde hair, uh, shoulder length, like desperately trying to be Kurt Cobain in my head. <laughs> She was a trans girl, for sure. Um, uh, with a black and white headscarf and red lipstick. And um, I'm not in a white room. I'm in like a mauve, dark red. Let's go blood red. Uh, Coloured room, um, which is, yeah, both my studio and my bedroom in Shetland. Um, yeah. Great. So I want have... to be here. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good to have you here. <laughs> um, I have a very quick bit of housekeeping to run through before I do a formal introduction. Um, so the event is being subtitled and you should be able to access a captions link that gives you options to change the sizing and formatting. And this can be found in the chat. You can also access these by pressing the CC button on the YouTube player. The format of today's event is that Belladonna has chosen some materials that have inspired her and her work, particularly during her time with us at Wising. We're going to play them, show them or read them and then talk about them. After about 40 minutes, there will be time for questions from the audience. And if you have a question, you can just pop that in the chat. And if you want to revisit the event later, we're going to archive it as a video podcast and transcript. There's some content warnings, so just so you're all aware, we'll play a clip from the show Hannibal, and in this clip it shows violence being done to a corpse. Um, this will be played towards the later half of the event today, and I'll flag it again before it comes up. So I'll now introduce Bella. Belladonna Paloma is an artist, poet and witch living in Shetland 
and she paints tattoos, writes poetry, and makes computer games. Her work is into listening to fairies, how divination disturbs linear time, grief rituals, toilets, and necromancy. Bella makes art as an act of devotion. This devotion has recently been centered on Shetlands, Boglands, and wetlands more generally, continuing her interest in the politics and mysticism of waste. So Bella Donna, hello. Could you give us a very quick introduction or summary of your current practice for those who might be unfamiliar with your practice today, I mean, that are joining us today? Sure. Um, well, yeah, so I'm, I guess I kind of quite often use these like, this like three, three-parted um, description, which is like, I paint, I write poetry, and I make computer games. Um, and those, all of those three things are sort of engage with the same thing, which is, again, three things which is like grief, waste, and devotion. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I guess maybe I can, like the last lot of paintings that I did was, was I guess I'm kind of really interested in toilet gods and like the idea of, of, uh, prayer towards something that we would traditionally um or particularly in the west frame as being a kind of object of um disgust yep sounds great and i was also wondering before we get started if you could give us an a little taster of what you might have gotten up to at wising yeah Absolutely. Um, I mean, I had a great time. It was an amazing place to like the best residency ever, basically. Um, I made lots of use of the, particularly the sound studio was like pretty massive for me in terms of like getting to use good microphones, like, and also like just, Something about being left in the studio, like being able to to be in the sound studio on my own and that kind of the kind of intimacy that comes with like being on your own mm. um, was really powerful. There was something. Um, I, so I was basically I was producing um, the sounds of the bog was kind of largely what I was doing which was like all with my mouth mm -hmm. involved really slowly eating a banana into a microphone or like gurgling water or yeah producing like foley I guess for foley sounds um for uh, a sound work that was shown as part of um Rabindranath exposes show in collective gallery in edinburgh and it's going to be we're kind of working it up into a bigger performance for gi next year incredible great that sounds so good um so i think we should move into your first item for today so can you tell us what we're about to look at and why you have chosen to share this with us and i believe lucy has a slide for us now yeah I can do that. Um, <laughs> the first thing that we're going to look at, I think, without seeing the slides here, I think this is right, is yeah. this book, which I've put beside me anyway, so you can see it now, which is um, a book of medieval women's visionary literature. Ah, perfect. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. There we go. Ta -da. Um, which is edited by Elizabeth of Alvilda Petrov, um, which is, yeah, as it sounds, like um, basically a collection of explicitly Christian to um, <clears throat> um, women's kind of mystic writing. Mm -hmm. 
most of whom are involved in the church in some way, but um, many of whom became involved in the church through kind of illness, it being a fairly like alternative way of life um, to, to, to go and like, particularly for women, you know, throughout the met, like the, the kind of um, quote unquote medieval mm -hmm. period. I say quote unquote because like the medi the word medieval is itself a kind of um renaissance enlightenment invention um as an attempt to say like that stuff back there is medieval we are now no longer medieval mm -hmm. yeah. a way of delineating yourself from your past like we are now enlightened and we therefore have the ability to go and enlighten other people. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I guess that's kind of part of what I find so fascinating about this book is it's completely unlike what I had been taught was like the foundations of like the Christian faith, mm -hmm. let's say, which like, as I was taught, it was kind of like, um, could broadly be summed up as like a hatred of the body, a hatred of like the senses, a kind of, and this book is so far from that and shows it's, like a lot of the writing is incredibly erotic um like which is just so interesting this there's this kind of um yeah you get a strong sense of like it's it's not just like uh ascetic and devoid of kind of like luxuriousness um you know a common theme throughout it in like almost all of the women's this, like writings is like um these kind of and it I guess it's called visionary because it's quite often like born of uh hallucinatory visions like mm. um God talking to them and talking through them and um yeah like a common image is is this this depiction of them drinking from Jesus's wounds and it like Jesus's wounds feeding them mm -hmm. um and it's and you know they're like pretty close to orgasmic when during that feeding time <laughs> great shall we before um we hear an extract but i believe you've got two extracts for us from this book which i can't wait for you to read if that is okay could you do a quick um audio description of this front cover for us oh of course thanks for reminding me yeah so this is a it's like a a kind of mustard yellow cover um and in like a dark red um, italic font we see the words medieval women's visionary literature edited by Elizabeth Alvilda Petrov and then we see a picture a kind of medieval uh, line illustration which may be quite hard to see here but it's um, there's three people to the right who were sort of have their arms outstretched and then we've got two people off to the left who are playing music and someone in the center who seems to be dancing a kind of wild dance and their clothes are sort of wrapped around them um and yeah I guess there's a kind of sense that they are in some kind of ec ecstatic state incredible Great. And I remember when you've showed me this before, 
um, we sort of described it as medieval fanfic, which mm. we love. But yeah, let's hear the first extract that you've chosen for us today. Would you be able to put it onto the next one? Yeah. Thanks. So this is um, this is an extract of Julian of Norwich, um, who was a woman. Um, I am terrible with dates so I can't remember the like this book ranges from like 300 till I think about 1500 um like AED um so I think Julian of Norwich is maybe around the 1200s 1300s or so um so this is this is just a, a a kind of black image um with a bit of um uh, um tightly cropped text so i'm going to read some of this um and as they reached the brows they vanished and even so the bleeding continued until i had seen and understood many things Nevertheless, the beauty and the vivacity persisted. The copiousness resembles the drops of water which fall from the eaves of a house after a great shower of rain, falling so thick that no human ingenuity can count them. And in their roundness, as they spread over the forehead, they were like a herring's scales. This vision was living and vivid, and hideous, and fearful, and sweet, and lovely. Amazing. Which, you know, feels pretty, just like overflowing. I mean, I think I, I love that one because it literally describes this kind of, um, yeah, I mean, she's describing blood you know the the blood pouring from a wound but it's it's it like resembles the drops of water which fall from the eaves of a house it's like pouring off everything is soaked it's kind of like yeah i i, I think it's um i i find it really exciting yeah <laughs> so i found it incredibly exciting to come across this book and to be like wow like Wow. <laughs> I think I'm into the last sentences so much as basically the vivid and hideous and fearful and sweet and lovely. I think that's just incredible. Isn't um, it though? Yeah. I, yeah, that sense of it like, the. I mean, it's kind of, you know, in a way it's that classic kind of um, like sublime, like the, the, the sublime is like this thing that like, um makes you cold makes you shiver how how by the size of it and like which itself is something about like the fact that she's describing the vision like the hallucination that she's having herself i don't yeah maybe hallucination is the wrong word vision the vision that she's having because it's like embodied you know i guess is the thing yeah I love, so much of the the writing is involves the body so going back to that idea of like a kind of hatred or mistrust of, of the body um feels so far from 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 this writing yeah so oh. shall we go to your next clip as well <clears throat> So um, this is a like a, a kind of white um, cropped picture screenshot of, of um, one of the pages from this book um, with black text on it. Um, and I guess this then comes into, I mean, it's complicated. This writing is really like messy. Mm -hmm. it, it's, and there's there's lots of messy stuff in there around like disability and illness 
and and how that kind of like um you know the the kind of uh um what's the word like honor of suffering um but again i think there's something kind of interesting here in terms of like illness as illness as a portal illness as marking you as special rather than marking you as less than yeah um that's interesting it's complicated but it's interesting so anyway that like that was just to give you a little preamble into this one which okay. so this this one reads so this one is I think this is Catherine of Siena, um, from what I remember. Um, my body is in long torment, my soul in high delight, for she has seen and embraced her beloved. Through him, alas for her, she suffers torment. As he draws her to himself, she gives herself to him. She cannot hold back, and so he takes her to himself. Gladly, would she speak but dares not. She is engulfed in the glorious trinity in high union. She gives, he gives her a brief respite that she may long for him. She would fain sing his praises but cannot. She would that he might send her to hell, if only he might be loved above all me measures by all creatures. She looks at him and says, Lord, give me thy blessing. He looks at her and draws her to him with a greeting the body may not know. So, Which, again, going so going back to like that um, thing you mentioned, Ruth, about like fan fiction. I mean, it like I don't know. This really struck me as like it feels like Mills and Boone, it, like it <laughs> Jesus fanfic, you know? Yeah. And it, but it's yeah. Which is not to de denigrate it. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of like of yeah, um, erotic writing, and but and I think that there's something about this that feels really, it's it's um, yeah, powerful. Again, yeah, it is. That's weird. Yes, <laughs> very <laughs> weird. Um, but it, yeah, it it does, um, I guess, make sense in your practice as well, because these things are so bodily and sort of oozing. And then earlier you were talking about how you've been making these bog noises and thinking through all of those things. So it's interesting to pop that into that context. And I was just wondering if you could say a bit about what this means in relation to your practice. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, it. I, yeah, I think that's really nice. What you were just saying there, jumping off from that, I guess, like, um, there's something about, like, working against shame. I mm -hmm. guess I would, I would sort of broadly say it as. But like um, something about like working enjoying enjoying the body, <laughs> like enjoying the sounds that it makes. Like that's there's something about like in a funny way, this is this is a sort of convoluted little loop but like it comes round to this idea of grief and the idea of like what you the things you remember of a person the things you give honor and love to the things that you like uh say are worth being remembered and like there's something about 
queer grief for me that that comes back to like um the bits of us that we're allowed to like have in our death um that so much of a person gets lost and there's a big like yeah a big part of my work which is kind of um effectively about like um eulogies and mm -hmm. the kind of power of eulogies and um yeah for me that's part of where this kind of like um this wetness this leaking this kind of like like bodies falling apart but also like overflowing yeah <laughs> like um there's something about like that's yeah I want to like eulogize that like that is my experience of having a body um and um and I think that like it feels so there's a kind of ethics I suppose um to that kind of honoring and there's something that I found I guess really exciting in this writing because it feels really uh free and like and like you said like so bodily so kind of like um and it's interesting right because like this is a time when women are like very very not free obviously like no one is free until we're all free. But women in the Middle Ages are like, you know, it have, yeah, very cloistered lives mm -hmm. a lot of the time. At least we think they do. Yes. There's not a huge amount of information necessarily. Um, but some of the information we have is is you know these kind of like um these abbeys that that a religious life could be a life of freedom of sorts yeah a life of self um yeah sovereignty in a weird way and there's something about the kind of um Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yes. Um, so with this in mind, should we look at your next image? Yeah. Uh, and if you could audio describe this for us as well. Yes, of course. Um so this is from um it's it's a small painting that's from what's called a book of hours. Um, a book a book of hours was just the name that was given to um a privately made bible um it's a very lovely phrase um and so this is this is a book this is a painting from one of these books that was produced um by pierre villet um or valetti um and his workshop because you know it would have been a group effort um, it's, we see kind of like a window frame type shape, um, with a curve at the top. We can see a cross, um, a wooden cross on top of which is the letters I-N-R-I, -I, um, which is like the name, the name of Jesus or some, I can't quite remember what I-N-R-I -I means now. Anyway, um, there's a ladder going up the side of it there is a crown of thorns hanging off one end of it there is 
uh, purple garments hanging off the other end. There is um, a pink pillar mm -hmm. that's going up just alongside this cross, on top of which is a bird, some kind of chicken, maybe, and um, and a head. Then on top of that, there are some hands kind of emerging from the edge of the, the frame. Um, they may, I think, from what I can remember, you can't see them here, but they have a holding kind of like um, pencils or, or paintbrushes or something. Um, but most importantly, at the base of the cross on the floor is some very vulvic yeah. lips mm -hmm. slash gash slash mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like I'm trying to describe, I don't how would you describe that? Yeah, I was thinking it's basically a vulva at the bottom. Uh, yeah. Um, but Which, I was... <laughs> sorry, you go on. <laughs> no, I was just wondering um, what made you choose this, especially um, thinking about the text that we heard before. So this is just one of like, you know, if you type in Jesus wound into mm -hmm. Google Images, um, you'll see this is like, one of of hundreds of such images that were produced um which depict this sort of uh detached or disembodied wound it's jesus's wound but it's it's kind of been moved from his body um and i this one I find in particularly interesting just because it's like on the ground. It's on the floor. Like quite often they are um, vertical rather than horizontal. And there's something about the fact that like, yeah, it's like this wound in the earth um, that I find... I mean, this image is beautiful in lots of ways and is kind of like quite often how I like I make art in general, particularly images, you know, like I love to find a structure and that I can hang a load of stuff off yeah. inside the painting. Like um, it's quite often how I use like uh, motifs um, so like toilets for example are like my current is like my current um, kind of stand in and then I'm I'm it's I'm just interested in like what what can you hang on and around a toilet like and there's something about this that's like this cross with all these objects hanging off it and yeah then this wound this this vulvic wound um and so that goes back to this kind of all of this writing these women's writing of like feeding yeah. off of um jesus's wound and there's something which then yeah it's something that's so interesting that you know then makes jesus into like a very kind of queer and trans character in terms of like body modification and like creating orifices yes yeah and then the writing about it and the desiring closeness to those things and um thinking about what these paintings might have done at the time and the sort of cult of relics that then they would have communicated to an audience so thinking about why they might draw certain pieces because of what body part supposedly different churches would have um, is so interesting. And I was thinking about 
this painting yet, yeah, especially just in relation to your practice and what your own sort of reliquary language is and, and what mm. things, what symbols you've used to sort of, that do kind of look like this in your practice and what those collections do together. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. That's nice. I like that. Reliquary, rel reliquary practice. <laughs> can't quite say it but yeah that's lovely um and does feel pretty like um accurate or like mm -hmm. there's something about um I find reliquies like So interesting, these kinds of um, again, in terms of like, especially in terms of objects of healing. Yes, I think that like you know, um, there's something about like. What can you do with an object? What can what can what can I mean? Like you know, uh, as as you mentioned, like um, I'm a witch, and like which you know, in in fairly broad, but also fairly like specific ways, um, means that I'm an animist, which means like I, it's it's there's there's a kind of uh something serious that has to be uh, a seriousness that has to be approached with images it's like what is this image doing what does it want to do like um yeah so i think we should move on to the next item yeah how are we doing on time so I think we're going to have to speed through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the moment, we're get, just thinking about relics and bodies. Um, we're going to look at the bog body and the bog people. So could you tell us about this and give us a quick audio description? Yeah. Um, so this is a, um, the cover of a book that we see with the words PV Glob. Um, and the title is of the book is The Bog People, Iron Age Man Preserved. Iron Age Man Preserved, sorry. Um, and you can see the face of, this is the Tolland Man, um, who is a Swedish or Norwegian, um, like very famous bog body, basically, one of the most famous. Um, we can see a very like, it's it's all in red, and then the image is kind of black and white, um, black and red, I should say. And like, we can see a sort of scrunched up face. Uh, their eyes are closed. Their lips are sort of slightly pouted. And you can see a little braid down at the bottom, yeah. um, which is, yeah, I guess that, there's, I feel like we can do quite a good segue here between both the bog people and Hannibal. Um, sorry, is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Um, oh. Do you want to go to the next slides? Oh, yeah. Um, so, yes. So this, so this shows... Um, this is a page spread from the book, The Bog People. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see a black and white image of, again, the Tolland man um, from a different kind of vantage point above this time instead of straight on. Um, and underneath the words are written, the dead and the sleeping, how they resemble one another. And then on the right side of the page, we can see some of his the objects that he was like buried with basically um 
and it it lists them at the bottom: the Tolland man's noose, cap, and belt. And um, the Tolland man is, I think, three thousand years old, or maybe even more than that. No, yeah, I think it's th I think three. Let's go with three. Um, and yeah, so it was discovered in 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 a bog whilst whilst cutting peat, um, which is something that we do here in Shetland too, um, to to burn. Like that's our main source of fuel. So we don't have really have any trees here, um, and. Um, There have been many like bog people that have been found basically um whilst cutting peat and part of what i'm interested in here is which which will kind of get us on to talking about hannibal um is something about a different kind of relationship to um, human sacrifice or sacrifice in general. Um, and like, it's, it seems fairly clear that this was an act of human sacrifice. Um, now, there are some kind of weird things about the Tolland man. Um, the Tolland man has was was kind of like quote unquote a victim of what's called the tri the triple death um he was hung he was um knocked over the head and he was um stabbed in in the belly basically um and which is overkill you know, lit, I mean, very, quite literally overkill. Um, but there's something about this that kind of weirdly shows a degree of care and love mm -hmm. and honour. There was, I'd, we don't know, but like, I have heard it said, and I kind of, this feels true to me, that these ritual bog deaths were, the people that were killed were like very special mm -hmm. and were chosen to carry a message to the gods or to the land of the dead. Or like, you know, it's, and it's interesting that the bog is a, is is the site in which that happens. The bog as a kind of, portal um to to the other the other side the bog as an in-between like there's been lots written about how kind of like the Celts and like yeah let's go Celts but like that's a very broad term and it's kind of a it's kind of the wrong term particularly for the Tolland man, but still, um, like Celts are. Th there's been lots written about how like much interest there is in like these in between spaces, like the beach or a lake. Yeah, these landscapes that are in between one place and another, mist for example, a crossroads. Mm -hmm. um, and the Bogland is another one of these in-between spaces. And it's interesting to me that, like, from, for, at least from what I understand, the first thing that Rome did when they invaded Britain was they outlawed human sacrifice. Okay. And there's something interesting that can be seen there in terms of like why would you want to outlaw that like well because you have a very different relationship to 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 what a people is mm -hmm. like they are laborers 
Rome, Rome was amassing a workforce, you know, like they, they only have an interest, had an interest in people in terms of like, um, what, so, so yeah, like value, um, monetary value. And so to be sacrificed was to lose, um, a worker. Yes. And probably a very valuable worker too. Um, and yeah, so there's like, it just has this like little hint of another way of looking at, at death. Yeah. Hmm. If you, but there's Which a... maybe then gets us on to talking about Hannibal. Yes. Yeah. So shall we watch the video clip? Um, Lucy, are you okay to um, move us to that? And just again, oh, yeah. that there is a comment. Oh, Fungus. We we'll go we'll, back. We'll come back to fungus. Um, <laughs> just to let everyone know, we are over time a little. So we oh, are we? Okay. We'll be cutting the questions, but um, we will pop um, Bella's email address and Instagram in the chat so you can get in touch with her after. Yeah, I'm always more than happy to talk <laughs> about this stuff. Sorry, okay. I was That's just right. pontificating. <laughs> totally losing track of time. Very interesting. So let's watch this Hannibal clip and then you can tell us why you chose this and what it makes you think in relation to your work. We have a basic affinity for our family. We can detect each other from smell alone. You recognize us? My father made it. Out of bone. Your father never wished for anything but your happiness. My father cut my throat. Out of love. That wasn't love. Every family loves differently. Every love is unique. You deny your love for your father because of what it might mean about you. Can you smell him here, Abigail? Yes. This is what your father is. This is all of him now. This is what death has reduced him to. All that's left is honesty. He was as good to me as he knew how to be. Hunting with him was the best time I ever had. Yes. A fine definition of love. You have to allow yourself to love him the way he loved you. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy and Bella. Can you tell us some more about um, your thoughts on this clip and why you've chosen this? So I guess there's a, yeah. I was just as we were watching it, I was kind of like noting down. I was like, oh yeah, there's like there's a lot here. There's yeah. a lot in the whole show, but like mm -hmm. just in this clip alone, I think there's something. So smell, for one, I think is like in terms of like. Um, the importance of smell as a sense um, 
as a sense that feels like it's often forgotten, but actually like I think plays a huge part and it and 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 certainly in my experience with like the spirit world, like it's all of the stuff of the body that like um that 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 gods and the dead and spirits are like interested in us for. So our smells, like the fact that we can smell, it's like these are these are like things that they love, you know? Yeah. And there's something that's kind of really Yeah, that all throughout Hannibal, you know, like he never like eats, he never drinks anything without smelling it first. It's like this is there's a strong thing of smell all throughout the series. Um and and then bone, there's something like the knife is made of bone. Um, and all throughout, there's this kind of idea of like love and care, like weird versions of love that are like seem pretty against what we might think about as love, right? Like, um, she's abigail says she cut my throat he cut my throat and hannibal says out of love and like and then he he asks her to like love her father how he knew how to love and so she cuts his throat too this kind of like um there's something I don't know. I feel like I keep saying the word powerful. <laughs> um, but like, it, I don't know. That, that's kind of, I think that, that I find it powerful. Yeah. <laughs> and powerful feels like, I guess kind of gets at something maybe that, that, that for me I guess we haven't really touched on but like I think is a large part of like where this sort of stuff like like smell comes from which is an interest in these the kind of sense sensory parts of of, of being a like a living body mm. which is that it's like not rational mm. it's not born of thought it's born of like experiencing the world being with the world being in it and like it's kind of hard to say good thoughts <laughs> and you know it's stuff about it it's like which is kind of part of what I um I always get really nervous when people ask me to talk about my work because I I find, I find it really hard like I can kind of like give suggestions and then and I guess in a way right this is like a collection of like this is stuff that like I'm drawn to mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know entirely why mm -hmm. and like cannibalism is like something that that is like I'm I'm kind of thinking about a lot at the moment and something about being eaten there's this line from a from from a game I made few months ago now the flowering milk of the bog head which is the line is just like um you can't fake digestion mm -hmm. like you can say anything you want but like if you if you eat a thing that that means something it's it's in you then yeah <laughs> like um and there's something about, you know, Hannibal, obviously it features lots of cannibalism. And there's there's a lot about in there about what it is to eat, what it is to be eaten. Yeah. And I guess on from other things that we've looked at in this visit, there's the religious aspect of, you know, relics and trying to get close to these body parts in order to kiss um kiss them and touch them and when you go to church if you have um uh, the eucharist and you're eating 
the body and the blood and things like that. So, you know, there's all of those connotations as well. And like what that desiring does, I guess, which is just really interesting in that it's there in your practice. Mm. Well, I, which I think was, it was, it was a real revelation to watch this show mm-hmm. for me, like um, shout out to, to Uma Breakdown who, who put me onto <laughs> it. Um, they were like, you know, oh, what? I haven't seen it. It's like, well, it never really appealed. And then when I watched it, it was like, whoa, it appeals massively. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. Right. That is great. I also was thinking just in terms of all of these other things that we've looked at, of thinking about like who those bodies would then belong to in terms of like these bog bodies and mm. these bodies and what happens afterwards. And I find that all really interesting. Um, and is something that has come up, I think, quite a lot today. Um, I'm very time. So if we would like to just skip back to uh, the bogeyman. Um, if we can see, and then be yeah, able to look at this. And this is our last thing for today. Sure, it's a great thing to end on. Yeah, <laughs> and slightly lighter. Slightly well. lighter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but Good. you know, I feel like it's of a piece too. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a, this is a page spread of of um, from Raymond Briggs's um, Fungus the Bogeyman, which is a children's sort of storybook. Um, that Raymond Briggs wrote, um, which follows this kind of the the life of this guy called Fungus, who is a bogeyman, who and bogeymen are are sort of like the opposite of humans, in the sense of like particularly in relationship to cleanliness specifically um so we can't like it it, yeah in this in this kind of image i'll just describe some little bits of it um because there's quite a lot in there to describe yeah um but it's sort of a comic set of comic panels and i think that the one even if we just focus on this one at the top here on the top left there's something kind of really fun (laughs) about like a relationship to going back to this idea of waste yeah. and this idea of like loving the unloved I guess and there's something really a bit beautiful about like that bogey bogey men bogey people bogey folk um love all the stuff that we hate mm-hmm. so like you know um, there's like uh, we can see Bogey here sat reading a newspaper over his breakfast and the, the kind of headline is slime shortage and um, the one of the boxes of cereal says flaked corns which is like and then it has a picture of a foot so it's 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 you know uh scraping foot <laughs> scrapings basically which is what they have for breakfast mm-hmm. um and uh the little kid that we can see from the back of his head um has a little kind of his speech bubble reads these flaked corns are still a bit crisp not quite moldy enough yet so this desire, this kind of like, and that that's there's lots of just jokes all the way through the book about like, you know, he goes to like put on his clothes in the morning and they're like a bit too dry, mm-hmm. they've not they've not gone up they've not gone frosty enough yet, like they smell too clean. Um, they call each other drear or dreary instead of dear or dreary. Um, there's lots of like. Yeah, I love the art style of this. For one, it's so wet and like damp. It's in these kind of like 
browns and greens, which that seems to be my color palette at the moment, basically. Like, um, and yeah, like there's something about. the joyfulness of kind of like it's very joyful it's very silly but it's also very like um taking a lot of like pleasure yes pleasure. In, in the stuff that we think we we usually try and get rid of yes and it's like placing that yeah as first as their favorite things which yeah <laughs> exactly. yeah it's just fun yeah. and I I think about it a lot yeah it was a really like uh like important thing and uh, for me to read it as a kid it was really exciting because again it's like full of smells it's full of like all the stuff that you're told to kind of like be ashamed of as a kid like um yeah yeah and I'm very conscious of time so I would just like to flag that you are working on a series called Filthy Mystics which I think you've taken a lot of inspiration from this item so I was just wondering um, as we come to an end if you can flag future projects that we can look out for mm. next. absolutely um so yeah, filthy. There's there is upcoming filthy mystics, which is which is which is uh with um Daniela Vals Jen and um who who is a dear friend of mine um which is a is a kind of collection of writing um that we've been doing for the last few months together um. All about filthy mysticism, basically, um, which is kind of broadly a lot of what we've spoken about today, pretty much. Um, and uh, I have a game, a new game coming out with Uma Breakdown, um, the Well of Sickness Shimmering, which um, just launched recently in at the Overkill Festival in the Netherlands, but it will be being launched online imminently. And yeah, next year um, I'm doing a performance with um, Rabindranath X Bose and Oren Shoesmith. And yeah, um, that's kind of all of our lots of collaborations, mm -hmm. which is nice. I love collaborations, mm -hmm. especially when I get to do it with my friends. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Sorry we <laughs> ran over. That's okay. Thank you so much. We were a little bit late. So thank you yeah. for all of um, your works with us and your inspirations and influences. Um, yeah, and I hope you all enjoyed that. And I would just like to do a little shout out to remember to sign up to Wising's newsletters for more news on our programs. But for now, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again, Bella. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Cheers, Ruth. And cheers, Lucy. And cheers, John. Yeah, thank background you. Too, and our captioner Jane. Too. Yes. Yes. Thank um, you. Thanks so much. Bye.